Guys, I just want to give a shout out to our worship team. Didn't they do a phenomenal job this morning? Rocking, rocking the old school songs, right? I saw, I saw the preteens, you guys were rocking it, you know, going back and forth, and the teens were, the teens are in the house. So, uh, you know, it, it takes a village. It takes a village to do what we're doing. If you're a guest here today, I want to welcome you to our service. Uh, we are right in the middle of a series that we started last week called Regroup, and you have no idea how important this is going to be in your life if you really get what we're talking about today. So in order for us to get this, I want to, let's just start out with a word of prayer, okay? So if you wouldn't mind, could you stand up and honor the Lord? And let's, let's stand and pray together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for the privilege that we have to be together. Thank you for our brothers and sisters that are online. Uh, Santa Rosa, God, I pray you bless them and, and, and people watching online. Use this service today. I pray you'll fill me with your spirit. I pray he will speak today. Help our hearts to be receptive. I pray for our friends that are here with, visiting with us, God. Uh, I don't know where they are, but you do. And I pray that you'll minister to them where they are. Help them to know that you love them and you have answers to their needs. Father, we love you. Thank you. Be with the needs in our church. Father, there's, there's, there's so many, and I pray that you'll uh, just bless our, our nation, world leaders. God, bring us together. There's a lot of things going on, and we pray, God, that there will be great humility and a turning to you. Father, we love you. Be with us. Fill us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Awesome. Go ahead and have a seat. Appreciate you guys filling out the survey as we got started this morning. Uh, you know, one of the things that we're talking about group life is in our core values a as a church. We, we really believe that life is better connected. Life is better connected. Uh, things are going to go much better for you if you're connected. But we have to understand a principle that's going on in our world right now. The world's getting more and more isolated. We talked about this last week that, you know, even though we're more connected with our phones and, and, and the ability to connect, we're very disconnected. There's more lonely people now than there's ever been, and that shouldn't happen. And there's nothing like human contact, and so that's the whole reason we're doing this series called Regroup, because we as a church need to regroup, okay? Everybody needs to understand groups are so important. It's all part of Jesus' plan. So we talked about this last week, and this is what we want to see happen as a church, but it goes beyond that. This is what Jesus really wanted to see happen. And, and he says it like, or we, we say it, but this is what, what he believes. A community of Jesus followers who are in real relationships creating community. In other words, we're building. We're always growing our relationships. We talked about this last week. Circles are better than rows. Let's go ahead and say that together. Circles are better than rows. Over on this side, circles are better than rows. This is a huge, important point because shoulder to shoulder, you know, church, sometimes we get faked out. If you're a guest here today, you can think, well, this is church. No, this is a part of church. But as we talked about last week, rows don't know. Shoulder to shoulder, you really can't know what's going on in, in other people's lives, so you've got to be face to face. And that only happens in a circle. And that's why it's so important that you and I get in a circle and are part of a circle. So we talked about this last week. Also, anything, if it's good for us, guess what we do? We drift from it. We drift from it. Anything, diet, exercise, academics, you name it, if it's good for us, we drift from it. And so groups, guess what has happened? We've drifted from it. And so this whole series is about pulling things back together again to make sure that everybody's in a group. And if you're a guest here today, we want to invite you to be a part of our group life Amen. so that you can get connected and know about groups. So today we're going to look at a story in the Bible, an awesome story in the Bible, Nehemiah. He's a hero, uh, one, an outstanding man that God used to re help rebuild uh, a city a group of people and, and create a revival. Uh, and, and it all revolves this idea of a wall that, you know, they were going to rebuild a wall and we're going to talk about walls today as, as a form of protection 
in our lives as a form of, 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 of being there. And the theme of the book of Nehemiah is this, rebuild, repair, and recommit. Rebuild, repair, and reconnect, and recommit. So I want us to, to look at, and this is so important that we look at the Bible because a lot of times people, and you know, college professors, there's people out there really bad in the Bible saying that it's a fairy tale. And, and I want us to appreciate that the Bible is not a fairy tale. People went to great, great lengths to assure us that what we're following is not a fairy tale, but we are following detail. Not a fairy tale, detail. And you can even see it in this beginning of the book of Nehemiah as he starts out. Verse 1, chapter 1, he says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year while I was in the citadel of Susa. Why did Nehemiah find it important to mention whose son he is? For the Jews, this is huge because Basically, by saying I'm somebody's son, I can trace my genealogy all the way back to Abraham. And they went to great lengths to write these things down so that we could know where's this all coming from. And in the month of Kislev, you know, uh, historians have basically narrowed this down in the Jewish calendar, November, December. So we're talking, we're talking who, when, and what? Where? Citadel of Susa. Anybody in the house know where the Citadel of Susa is geographically? Anybody? Well, I'm going to tell you. At this time, this was taking place at the year 445 B.C. History. There's, there's archaeological findings about Nehemiah when he rebuilt the wall and this went on. They can, they can narrow it down. Who was king? At this time, the citadel, this was basically a time when Persia, Persia was in power. And he was in Persia, in the citadel. Anybody know where that is? Iran. Iran. Persians, you knew that. Okay? So we can narrow it down to a place where he was. He was in Iran. And there's actually a location, the citadel of Susa. If you go to an archaeological map, you can find the spot. So here's Nehemiah, he's writing these words, he's telling us detail, who, when, where. Hanani, one of my brothers, and he's telling the story here, came to Judah with some other men, and I questioned him about the Jewish remnant that has survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. Why is this important? This is my homeland. Tell me about my homeland. I've been so far for so long. How are the people? I know it's been hard. How are they doing? You ever ask that question of a a relative or an old friend? How's it going back there? I've heard some not so good things. And so he's asking them, because there was a lot of bad things that had happened to the exiles and in Jerusalem. In fact, he was living there because of a conqueror that, that, that the Babylonians were the first ones to conquer. And then Persia took over. And verse Three, here's what he tells, his brother tells him. He, they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. So what condition is the city? It's terrible. It's a war zone. The wall's torn down. And look at Nehemiah's reaction. This is so important. Look at his reaction when he hears this news. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. What's this tell you about Nehemiah and his heart for Jerusalem and the people living there? It devastated him. Let me ask you a question. What is someone or someplace that if you found out it was devastated it would make you react like this. Well, who is it? Give me an example from the audience, a little audience participation. Who, who, like would you say, if you found out that they're in ruins, it would devastate you. Can you give me an example? New Orleans. Yeah, you got family in New Orleans? I mean, that place is, that place is upside down. People's houses and lives have been ruined. They've lost everything. If you've got family there, you're feeling that. 
You, you basically, you're saying, I got I to gotta pray for these people, right? It's close to home. Anything else? Anybody else? I'm sorry? Parents. Found out your parents are in trouble. What about your own family? If you're married and your children. That's the kind of thing that we're talking about. He, he wept and he prayed for some days. He didn't eat anything. He said, I can't eat. God, please. A great place to start when you're going through a hard time is turning to God and praying and fasting. And look at this prayer in verse 5. He says, Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps the covenant of love with those who love Him and keep His commandments. Why is he beginning the prayer like this? And a lot of men in the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, they always start their prayers this way. They're reminding God of His faithfulness. Does God need to be reminded of his faithfulness? So why do you begin a prayer like this? You're not just reminding God, you're also reminding yourself. See, because we're praying not just for his benefit, but for our benefit. And he's saying, God, I know you're faithful. And you hear prayer. And you love your people. And and, and you have a covenant of love. And you keep that covenant of love. But why is the city in ruins? If God is faithful, who broke the faithfulness? Here we go. Verse 6. I confess, this is Nehemiah, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servants, Moses. How did the city get destroyed? It's on us. You know, we live in a time right now where people don't take responsibility for what they're doing that's causing the problems. They turn it back on God and they say, hey God, why are you letting this stuff happen to me? And if it isn't you that's causing it, it's the wickedness of our society. It's not God's fault. You know, we look at the news and we say, why why are all these bad things happening? And I want to just say, would would you ever be in a position to confess the sins of the United States of America for you to take responsibility? God, I want to shoulder the sins of the whole country because I'm part of the problem. See, this is huge. When you pray and you want to turn things in your life, you've got to take responsibility. You cannot walk in a victim mentality that I am a victim here. It's somebody else's fault. You can't blame shift. If you want to see change in your life and in your circumstances, you can't blame shift. It starts out with humility. And let me ask you a question. We talked about this last week. Have you spent any time with anybody confessing? getting open? Or are you still locked in that place where you're blaming somebody else for your situation? Man, if you want your relationships, if you want your life to turn around, it, this is a great starting place. I own it. I own it. And I confess my sins, and he says, myself, we, we. Verse 8, remember. Remember, God. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather you from there and bring you or bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants, your people, whom you redeemed by your your great strength and your mighty hand. We're in the position we're in because of our disobedience, but remember, God, that you said through Moses, if we turn, if we turn, you're going to change things. Isn't that awesome? And God promises us that. The same as he promised Moses, he promised Nehemiah, and Nehemiah is saying, God, you redeemed us then, you'll redeem us now. But I'm taking responsibility for why I'm in the situation that I'm in. And I want to turn. I want to change. And this is a really great example 
of, of Nehemiah's prayer. And he finishes up, he says, then I said to them, or back up, this, he goes on and prays this prayer and asks God for specifically help because he was a cupbearer to the king and he was going to ask the king for letters, money, and to let him go and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And guess what the king did? By God's help, the king gave him money, gave him letters, and let him go. How long are you going to be gone, Nehemiah? I don't know. And the king still let him go. Isn't that powerful? God answered his prayer. So we jump to chapter 2. He's there in Jerusalem, and he goes out at night, and he looks at the city. He sees what's going on. He sees the state of the wall of Jerusalem and the city. And look at what he says. Then I said to them, the people of Jerusalem, he says this. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we'll no longer be in disgrace. I told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. Hey, God's doing something special, but I need your help. And he basically reminds them of the state of Jerusalem. And they knew it, but sometimes you know how it is. You can get, be in a really bad state and get used to it. We're in disgrace. And let's talk, about, let's talk about walls. What do walls mean? Do you have walls where you live? There are very few of us, if any, in this room today that have no walls where you live. Why do we have walls? They protect us from what? Weather, heat, rain, cold, you name it. Wild animals. Do we have wild animals in Southern California? Yeah. I mean, let's just imagine you wake up this morning and, and you got a coyote with his nose right on your face. And a little drool, boom, right on your cheek. What would that be like? Or worse, a mountain lion. I mean, we feel safe. Right? And even our, our little dogs could come inside and be safe too. Those walls protect us from opposing people. What if you went to sleep out in the open and all your stuff was out there? Would opposing people come and say, hey, this must be mine? It provides us with safety and, and a very important point, what walls provide? Identity. This is my house. This is my family. This is where we live. This is my space. And so for the same, for Jerusalem, it was the exact same thing. And Nehemiah goes on, he says, they replied, and this is the people's reply to Nehemiah, let's start rebuilding. So they began this good work, about 1,500 people. When, but when Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, the official, and Jeshem, the Arab, heard about us, they mocked and ridiculed us. What's this tell you? When you want to begin a good work, what, what happens? There's going to be some opposition. And too often, some you and I, when we start to do good things, we get some opposition, we get discouraged, and we quit. Hey, just understand on the front, there's going to be some opposition. Nehemiah had a lot of opposition, a lot of distractions. But the amazing thing is, everybody, about 1,500 people, historians estimate, they came together and they rebuilt this wall. Look at that. That's about 32 acres. City blocks, anybody know how to convert acres to city blocks? East Coast style? 16 city blocks. That's a big area, right? But the place was a mess and some of these blocks that they used we're not light. I mean, look at how big this wall is. It's, it's enormous. And, and this is kind of the, the drawing, the estimate of where Jerusalem sits. This is the Temple Mount. And this is the wall that protected them. It required some heavy lifting. But here's the amazing thing about this reconstruction. Everybody got involved in rebuilding. Except one group of people. And we're going to talk about them a little bit later. But after 52 days 
a month and a half because everybody, including Nehemiah, guys that didn't know anything about construction, they rolled up their sleeves and they said, let's rebuild this thing. And they finished rebuilding the wall in about a month and a half. That's amazing. And Nehemiah says, this happened with God's help. We didn't do it on our own. My back's a little sore, but God helped me. Right? Okay, so let, let's bring this down. Why are we talking about Nehemiah and walls and all of that? Let me ask you a question. What is like a wall in our church? Can you give me some examples? What's like a wall in our church? Protection. Okay? It, it protects us. It defends us. We, we have it surrounded our lives, our relationships, our marriages, our families. Can you tell me? What? Fellowship. Okay, if you're not a churchgoer, what does fellowship mean? Translate. I'm sorry? Relationships. Relationships. I mean, God is a wall around us, right? But practically speaking, what creates a wall in our lives? You want to know what it is? You ready? It's group life. It's group life. See, because I've been doing this for 31 years. It started in a group, and now I have three groups that I'm a part of. And I've always felt a sense of protection that people have my back. We talked about this last week. There's things in your life that you can't see, right? But if you're in a group and you've given permission to people in that group, they're going to tell you, hey, I don't think you're all that good right now, and can I help you? And you say, yeah. Do you know that group life has saved me from many, many, many challenges in my life? All right, so let me ask you a question, church. And if you're a guest here, you get to sit in on this conversation. What is the condition of our groups? I'm going to bring out a visual. i got some brothers here because some heavy lifting, heavy lifting. They're going to pull out the condition of one community group, one small group. Put your back into it, Anthony. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Because I love you. That's why I called you out. All right, so let me ask you a question. You guys, can you see that all the way in the back? Can you see what I see? Okay, take a look. We got some blocks here. It's supposed to be a wall, supposed to provide pr pr protection, but what is the condition of this group? It's broken down. It's in pieces. It's in pieces. Can I ask you a question today? What's the condition of your group? Are you even in a group? Does your group have anything resembling this? This is serious. See, because if you don't have walls, if you don't have protection, if you don't have things around you, people around you, to ensure that your life is going to go where it needs to go in God's direction, we can't do it alone. I mean, you're going to be in a mess. You're going to be in that kind of mess. And it's not going to go well for you. Let's look at this passage in, in Ecclesiastes. It's a very powerful passage. They use it for weddings. But it's not really for that. Any, any, any young marrieds in here, you use this passage in your wedding? Okay, there's Yvonne. Yeah, Alvin. Anybody else use this passage in your wedding? Hear this passage in your wedding? I like to use it. I've used it in a wedding. But it's not really the context of what we're talking about. Look at what, what, what Solomon says here. He says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. What's he saying here? Plural is better than singular. If two, three, four, five, six group of people come together, they're going to have a good return for their labor. It's going to go better. When you organize and when you come together, it's going to go better for you. It gets better. Look, at he says in verse 11, or verse 10, he says, if either of them, this is huge, this is a huge point, and this is what I want to leave you with. This is a memory verse for this week. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. 
Can we get to a, an agreement here this morning? We all fall down. Maybe you're here at church today as a guest because you've fallen down. And you need help up. You know what group life is all about? Having somebody next to you, somebody next to you to help you get back up when you fall. I've fallen down. And let me get specific. Areas in your life, like, for example, marriage, when your marriage is in crisis and you're down on the floor, you have people around you that can help you get up. Your career, your career has come to an end or it's, it's, create, it's come to a, a, a really critical spot. Who can help you in that moment? Your health. We got people in the church whose health is, you know, they're, they're in a really serious situation. It's, it's, it's critical. Who's going to help you through that situation? When your family is in trouble, your kids, if your parents, when your kids are in trouble, who's going to be there for you to help you up from that situation? Relationships, your health, academics, finances, the list goes on and on. This is what it's for. But listen to this. He goes on to say, but pity anyone who falls. We all fall, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help him up. That's bad. In the many years that I've been in church life, I've seen this story. And you see it at work, you see it in your neighborhood, you see it all the time. You see people who fall and, and, and they're looking around and they're going, I got nobody. Where's my family? In fact, sometimes family can create more problems and they can kind of kick you when you're down. What's that? It's because they have no moral principles. Sometimes when families aren't, aren't, aren't biblically oriented, you know what they say? When you fall down, they say, you see? You see, I told you, that's why you're on the ground. You see, I hope you can get up. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. Now, this is a huge deal because this is why we want to be in groups. How many of you guys missed the Olympics? I went through Olympic withdrawal on Monday. Because it's in like one of my favorite cities in the whole world, Rio de Janeiro. We lived there for six months, uh, planting a church there. Man, it just, it got me, it got me all choked up. I got to say it, on Sunday night when they had the closing ceremony, they had this woman, she was singing, and there were tears coming down, and, and she was singing. I, I started like, oh my gosh, what's going on? I'm getting emotional here. I miss my city. And I, I really enjoyed the Olympics because I love that spirit. But here's something that came out of the Olympics. I don't know if you caught it, but people fall down in the Olympics, don't they? They fall down hard. And we get to watch it in high definition. Let me show you this example, okay? A highlight. You ready? Ready? It's not that bad, but it's got to, you know, ready? Watch this. Have we got volume? I need volume. Help me, Chris. Here we go. No volume. Uh. Uh. That just hurts. It hurts watching it. Let me tell you the story. Watch this. Watch this. Isn't that lady's name is Abby D'Agostino. She's a U.S. athlete. She was tripped by Nikki Hamblin from New Zealand. They were both running. Now watch this. Watch this. She finished. She finished the race. Nikki tripped her up. Nikki tripped her up. I wish you could have heard because they, they, they shared and didn't hear the whole life highlights. But... What, Nick, what, what Abby said to Nikki when she fell down first, she stopped in the race, even though she twisted her knee badly. She told Nikki, you got to get up. This is her quote. You have to get up 
and finish. This is the Olympics. We finish. And then Nikki Havlin said, because she was able to finish, because Abby helped her get up. Interesting thing later in the race, Abby's knee went out. Guess who helped her up? Nikki did. It's a beautiful thing. They said, this is the spirit of the Olympics. It kind of got buried under all the Andrew Locke drama and, and terrible news. And just to notice, our news media is very negative. Careful with it. Look for the good. Find the good. Throw away all that bad stuff. This is great. And they said, Nikki said this, I'm so grateful for Abby for helping me. The girl is the Olympic spirit. I never met her before, but I'll never forget her. I mean, it's so powerful. But this is a sport. This is an Olympic event that happens once in four years. Can I ask you a question? This is important. But how important is your life? How important is your family? How important is your future? And, and, and what is it like, you know, if, if you don't have anybody to help you up when you fall in the race of life? When you're on the floor and you're hurting and there's nobody there. And the reason there's nobody there is because you haven't made the investment in involving yourself in a group. And you want to say, well, the church should be there for me. Well, what is the church? What is the church? Is the church a building? Hey, the church should be doing this. I'm going to call the church. Okay, you're going to call the building? I've got to talk to the church. Okay, well, I want you to understand something. There's numbers on the back of our newsletter of ministers. You can call them, but where you're really going to get the help that you need is group life. See, because only then, only then are you going to get the help. Because these are the people that know you. They know how you got there. They know how this happened, this, this, this idea of falling down. They know you. Will you let them in? Here's a question for you. Who feels free to ask when you say, are you okay? And won't accept, I'm fine. Know anybody like that? How you doing? Fine. <laughs> they won't accept, I'm fine. They won't accept because they know you and they care about you and they say, no, 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 no. Don't give me that I'm fine stuff. Bro, sister, come on, can we talk here a second? You're not fine. You, you're, you're, you're a mess. Can, can I help you? And see, this requires you giving a person permission. I give you permission to tell me what you see is a need in my life. You know what group life, when it's real, is when you give people in that group permission to help you. You say, I give you permission. Help me out. I'm in three groups. Everybody in that group knows you have permission to tell me what you see. Now, I have a church, and people very, feel very free to tell me what they see in me. And that's okay. I'm cool with that. But not everybody knows. But my groups know. I've got a small group in the family life ministry, and if they see that the door is open, the light is green. I may not like it, but the, the, the light is green. Please tell me. Please help me, because I can't see it. I don't see it. Do you see it? Yeah, you can probably see it in me. And then I've got the staff men and, and women. If they see something, they, they, they feel free. Rocio Serna, she's a Joel Serna, the Latin leader's wife. She feels free, very free, to tell me if she sees any interaction between me and Laura that she doesn't feel that it's appropriate. She goes ahead, hey, she's going, hermano, hermano Pedro, puedo hablar contigo. 
And I know, I know. Here we go. And I usually know what she's going to say, and she's right. She goes, you didn't treat Laura right there. And I've given her permission. See, in my group, I have her permission. And I have another group of the LA, LA group of other ministers. They also have permission to tell me. The, the elders of our church have permission to tell me. See, that is group life. They're not going to accept I'm fine. Verse 12. Though many be, be overpowered, two can defend, two can defend themselves a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And people do this. It's a real, very romantic thing that they take three strands, a husband and wife, and God is in the middle. That's not the, the whole passage. Okay? I know you got that strand hanging on the wall, and it's beautiful, it's romantic, that's cool, but that's not the whole meaning of the passage. What Solomon is talking about here is when you bring people together, they're not going to be broken. I've seen many, 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 many people in group who are broken, but they're not destroyed. They get help at rebuilding. Even stuff that is really ugly, okay? If they stay in group and they stay connected, they can rebuild. So do you have a group around you? And so on September 15th, I mean on September 25th, we're going we're gonna to have a really special day where we're going to have everybody ensure that they're in a group. Teens, even, even you guys in the youth ministry, you got to be in a group. Okay, and I'm going to show you how we build a group and who is in the group. Are you ready to see it? You guys like visual aids. Uh, and and i got to tell you guys, I've seen some really bad stuff. But let, let's just let's go ahead and, and rebuild this small group right here, this community group, okay? And it's a dirty job. It's heavy lifting. I want you to know that. You've got to roll up your sleeves. Are you with me? Okay, anybody want to come up here and help? It's all right. I got this. Okay, thank No, I'm serious. I've got to do this because it's important where these blocks go, okay? Because I've got some people in here. I've got some people in this pile of, of rubble, all right? So let's go ahead and get things together here, all right? This is a piece of the whole wall, which is our church, okay? I got another brother, sister over here, okay? But here's a really important part of this wall right here, and that is the leader of this group. He's key. He's key. Because he has decided, I'm going to steer this group. God has given me the ability and the gift to lead. And so I'm going to use that gift. And I'm going to point. I'm going to point these people. So right here is our leader. And if you're a leader of a small group, of a community group, I just want to thank you because you're key. You're key. Without you. Mm. What do we got here? All right, we got, we got uh, you know, some more people. You know, they're there, key people. Uh, you know, we got, we got a, a, a brother and a, and a sister right here. They're here, okay? And then, then uh, we got, we got where, where are you? Where are you? Here you are, okay? This is you. Seeing that? That's you. Then we got me. I'm over here. Okay, this is me. See me? Then we got some more people over here. Okay, you with me so far? Okay, got another person right here. All right, we got ourselves a, a, a better group, but I, I'm noticing somebody missing right here. So I got to go find them. Where is he? Where is she? Oh, look. I found him. Out there wandering. Okay? If you're a guest here today, I don't want you to feel left out. 
this is you. This is you. You're here. You're part of the group. Our church is structured like this. We got one group here, one group here, one group here, one group here, one group here. I want you to imagine all these people and our children down below, everybody in a group. Let me ask you a question. If we take out anybody in this group, will we miss them? Will it weaken the whole? And I, I just want you to know, I got some protection here. You come at me, I got a wall. I'm not exposed to the elements. I'm not exposed to the hardships of life, the challenges. I've got protection. This is, this is how we want it to look. This is how Jesus wants it to look. But when you've got a leader, see, in the past we looked at leaders and we said, He's got to shoulder all of it. We'll put him right here at the bottom, and, and he's got to hit, carry all the weight. No, 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 no. The way it is now, community group 2.0, everybody, everybody holds everybody together. He, all he is, all he, she is, is a facilitator. They help. They help. This is where God wants you. Okay? And if you're a guest... Trust me, you want to be in on this, okay? Back to the presentation, okay? Thanks, this is so that people can see. There was a group in Nehemiah's story, back to Nehemiah, there was a group of people who didn't want to be a part of a group and didn't want to help rebuild the wall. Can I share with you? The next section, and this is the cool thing about chapter 3, it goes by people after people. Even Nehemiah, he had his little section of the wall. Everybody, everybody. The next section was repaired by Tekoa. He must have been uh, from the islands, Tekoa. But, but their nobles, here it is, their nobles, their nobles would not put their shoulder to, their, the work to, under their, sh- their support. They wouldn't put their shoulders to the work. Why do you think a noble wouldn't want to do the work? Can you help me with, what's wrong with noble people? A noble means they're kind of wealthy and why do you think they didn't want to put their shoulder to the work? What? They're entitled? Hey, I don't do labor. I don't get dirty. And I'm not going to have somebody from out of town telling me what to do. See, because I'm a noble. I'm an important person. I'm entitled. You know what Americans have a problem with? Mm. Go someplace else around the world and they look at how they see Americans. Americans are entitled. They think they deserve everything. It's a problem. In church group life, there are people within our church who say, I don't have to be a part of a group because I'm an exception. I'm a noble. I'm a noble. Let's talk about wall breakers. Okay? This, this is an important part of our lives. But what breaks walls? Independence? Pride? The nobles had a lot of pride. Isolation? Okay? Busyness. I got to tell you guys a story. When I went to pick up these bricks at Lowe's, and the woman looked me over and she says, uh, she says, uh, you don't look like the construction type. And, she said, and I said, are you profiling me? <laughs> and so I told her the story. I said, I'm a minister. And you know what these are about? About groups. And I said, do you go to church anywhere? She said, oh, yeah, I go to church up here on the hill, and it's this, and this, this church. And I go, okay, are you in a group? Or do they have groups in your church? And she said, oh, yeah, I think so. I said, are you in a group? And she says, no, I, I, I can't because I'm too, too busy. I'm too busy to be in a group. My life's too busy. Let me tell you about busyness. You're going to fall, and when you need help, it's too late. I get it all the time. 
wrong priorities. We got, we got kids' sports. We got, we got a lot of stuff that's competing for group, for competing for the very thing that's going to hold your marriage, your family, your life, your spirituality. There's nothing more important. Because everything else is temporary. Let me tell you about my son's sports. We invested so much time and money in his sports. He quit. I'm like, what? You want to you wanna do what? He doesn't play the sport anymore. I mean, we were just like running around, going here, going there. And, and it was a conflict. It was a tension. And, and I got to say, you know, this was, a, this was a difficult thing. We had to make sure that our priorities are straight. God first. God first. Family first. And then the rest comes in line. And then this last one, past experiences. Have any of you here in your life had a bad group experience? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Because then somebody's going to come and talk to you. Tell me about your experience. If you've had a bad group experience, I, I got you. I know. I've been doing this a long time. I've had some groups. Mm. I mean, they were, they, were, they were not good. But just because it was a bad experience doesn't mean you ruined the whole thing because there's another great group right around the corner. And that's what I've experienced. I'm not going to let a bad haircut keep me from getting another haircut. I mean, how many of you ladies here today, sisters, have had a bad haircut or a bad color or a bad, you know, do, but you still keep going, right? Because you know if you don't go, it's not going to be good. Why would you let a bad group experience stop you from being a part of a wall that's going to protect you, that's going to keep you strong in your life? Don't do that. Do not be a wall breaker. And I want you to have some conversations. Maybe husband and wife, maybe in your group, maybe where, and, and let's talk about these things. What's going on? What's keeping you from being plugged into the church? You've got other things that are more important. Trust me, I get phone calls. There's a big difference between the church attender and a church member. Church members, they don't call me a lot with their problems. You know why? Because they're, they're plugged into a group. And that group helps them through their problems. But attenders, they call. They fall, they call. Because they don't have anybody to help them. There's nobody there. So they call the minister. They call the minister's wife. They call the elders. They say, hey, I need help. I'm in a crisis. And you know the sad story is? We get with them. We help them. But the truth, it's too late. It's too late. No, 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 it's never too late. Oh, there's times when it's too late. And I want you to understand something about group. If you want to be a member of our church, you got to be in a group. I want to stop wasting time, your time, my time, of saying, hey, God wants to help you, God wants to get you to grow, but if you're not going to be in a group, it's very hard for us to say, God's going to be with you and help you grow. And this is all over America. People go to church, shoulder to shoulder, they come in, and you don't know how many people, ex-members, have come to me and say, I switched churches. Do you know why they switched churches? Because I get them to tell me the truth. Tell me why you switched churches. It's more convenient. And I had one person tell me, it's right down the road. And I go in, and I go out, and we're done. And I, I squared up with them, and I said, bro, do you not understand that you're going to have some serious problems? There's not going to be anybody there for you? Convenience over prevention. I don't want to be one of those people. And, and understand this, group life is preventative. It's preventative. It, it's, it's, like, it's like saving up for retirement. You know it's coming, but you've got to set aside some money for it, right? What happens to people who don't have any retirement money? They call their kids and they say, hey, can you take care of me? 
And their kids are like, well, yeah, but you've got to live in the back. And it's sad when all they needed to do was set aside. Okay, and maybe that's not a great example, but I, I want you to understand, listen, we can't, we, can't measure, we can't measure in groups. We can't measure in groups the prevention that happens. How many teen pregnancies have we avoided because people are in groups? Because when they feel tempted, they talk to somebody in their group and they say, hey, this guy, he's really cute, he's after me. And the group says, hey, don't do it. Because he only wants one thing, and he will drop you. And she goes, yeah, I'm going to listen to my group. And that could have been a disaster. How many marriages have been saved from ultimate disaster? Now, we've had some marriages that have been disaster, and the reason they've been a disaster is because they're not really giving people in their group permission. And they go into the group, and they say, well, it's her fault. No, it's his fault. And they don't want to humble out and say, what am I going to do? Okay? See, because here's the deal. Because somebody can see what I can't. And how many of you have ever been, you know, on a Wednesday or a, a Thursday night, and you're like, man, I'm tired. It's been a long day, and we got group tonight. And, and, and you know, you're like, hmm. I think I just need to take the night off. Have you ever done that? I've been tempted to do it. And the truth is, I've sat at group alone or with one other couple. Here's the problem with group. When you go to group, it's not like it's going to change the world. You walk out of group and go, wow, what an incredible group. I mean, it was so awesome, man. It's just life-changing tonight. That's not what group life is. Group life is, is prevention. It keeps you together. It may not be your night, but it was somebody else's night in that group where you worked on them, you helped them. We go. It's the little things. Remember what we talked about last week? It's the little things. If you don't want to lose the big thing, do the little things. Group life is the little thing. And many times, Russ, I'm tired, but I go to group. Because I want to be there for somebody else. So let's, let's do this. Every marriage needs some support now to avoid, to avoid the need for life support later. You know when people come for marriage help? When they're on life support. And there's barely a pulse. And the papers, the papers are already at the lawyer's office. That's a little late. Don't you think? If you're in group life, you can start working on things way ahead. So let's do this. This is a very important point. Look to your neighbor and say, I need you. I need you. I need you. Now, now, look. Oh, wait a second. Now, I can't have this lack of participation in the church. I need you to look to him and say, I need you. I have to call people out in church. I need you. Sorry, just making an example. I need you. Now, here's the second part. Turn to them and say, do you need me? I need you. You need me. Okay. Let's bring this in. We're going to celebrate the communion. Guys. We're having some fun here, but this is, this is really, really serious. I want to call some of you out because you are completely removed from group life. You come to church when it's convenient. You stiff arm people. And then you're going to want help when things are a disaster and it's going to be too late. That is not what Jesus did when he died for us. This is serious. I've seen too many disasters. It hurts. It's painful. It's not my life, but it's yours, and I feel it. And I want to prevent it. Look at this. Visualize this. Ephesians 1, verse 7. His blood freely flowed down from the cross, setting us free. 
We're forgiven of our sinful ways by the richness of His grace, which He has poured, He has poured all over us. With all wisdom and insight, He has enlightened us to the great mystery at the center of whose will? His will. Not your will. His will. What's God's will for your life? John 13, 34. Jesus commanded us. I give you a new command. Love one another. As I have loved you, what did he do for us? He poured, he didn't just drop up some, sprinkle some blood. He poured his blood all over us because we needed it. Our lives are messy. We sin and he forgave us with immense pleasure. He's fired up. He laid out his intentions through Jesus. God's intention for you, if I can just get you to see this, is for you to be connected in a group loving each other. There is no more powerful thing in this world. If people are bad-mouthing Christianity, it's because they're not seeing the power of love. What they saw in the Olympics, that girl helping the other girl up, it was beautiful, it was powerful. That's Christianity. When Christians help Christians, everything changes. So right now we're going to take the communion and we're going to wrap this up. So bow with me if you would as we remember what Jesus did for us.